So uh, welcome guys, got a nice uh, small group here today, uh, but we are going to be talking, uh, welcome to patch chat. And we're going to be talking about the South Shore part. So we're defining that in this particular session as Rainbow Beach all the way down to Calumet Park, which is right there on the Indiana border. Um, so there's a lot of really fantastic parks within that spectrum of the lakefront there, some phenomenal birding. And we've got some of the finest birding experts on the area here with our call here today. Uh, I'd like to introduce for you guys uh, Isu O'Brien who uh, is a obviously a longtime birder and also just recently this year, like what, a couple weeks ago, smashed the Cook County Big Year record. Uh, a lot of those finds were at some of these South Shore parks, uh, but just in general, really excited to have him here. We've got Carl Giametti, uh, former COS, Chicago Ornithological Society president, uh, also longtime South Shore, Southside birder, uh, knows these sites pretty darn well. And then we also have Dan Laurie, who is like the guy for Park 566 specifically, which is one of the parks we'll be talking about today. Um, again, longtime birder, board member on the Chicago Ornithological Society. Uh, I'm really excited to have him here to talk about these sites. And my name is Edward. I'm president of Chicago Ornithological Society. And I'll be kind of moderating and seeing this event here tonight. Um, so for everybody else who's joining us here, thank you guys so much. Uh, as I haven't already mentioned, this is Patch Chat. This is a partner program with Chicago Audubon, uh, where we're just really seeking the highlights of these really awesome sites throughout the Chicago area and their great potential, especially in COVID times, giving you guys the benefit of having the expert knowledge right at your fingertips without having to actually go on a bird walk with said people. So thank you guys for being here. If you guys have questions while we're talking, go ahead and put it in the chat there uh, so that we see your questions come up and then during the course of the program, I'll make some time to have you guys uh, unmute yourself and ask those questions in person so we can address them in the program. So without further ado, I think we're going to go ahead and get started here. We're going to basically start up at Rainbow Beach and roll on down the shoreline here. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up a map. Uh, yes, I'm literally just going to be using uh, Google Maps to demonstrate our sites here today. But hey, you know what? If it works, it works. Share screen. Good enough for eBird. Yeah, right. Good enough for eBird. So I'm not going to complain. All right. So What's Google Maps. Oh. Can zoom out here. All right. So this is Rainbow Beach right here. Um, you'll notice that we have Lake Shore, South Shore Drive, Lake Shore Drive, depending on who you ask, coming down here. We have this water treatment plant, the Eugene Sawyer water treatment plant down on the south end of the beach. But first things first, actually getting here. I know actually from personal experience, having led a hike here just a couple of weeks ago, there was some confusion. Google sometimes leads you astray. So I would say, and I think uh, my, my, my uh, guests here can sort of corroborate or disagree. The best way to get here is actually through Farragut Drive down here, uh, just off the South Shore Drive on 79th Street. Uh, Farragut Drive is what's going to take you uh, directly past the water treatment plant and to this main part of Rainbow Beach. And this is really where the good birding starts. So definitely make a note of that here. You're going to want to go to Farragut Drive. Um, maybe if it's easier to put in the uh, purification plant into your uh, na navigation system, that might get you closer to where you want to be. But I have some questions for our experts here about uh, birding at Rainbow. And I'll go ahead and get started, just kind of an open-ended question to any one of you three folks. Um, in your experience, where's the first place you want to go? When you show up, roll up at Rainbow, parking, bus, whatever it is, where do you guys go first thing? Where do you roll up? Well, hold on, Edward. Uh, if you want to go back to that map there. Oh, um, sure, yeah. You don't, at least this year, especially, you don't want to just roll through Farragut because there's actually a wild turkey that has been hanging around uh, kind of the grass lawns. Switch to the uh, satellite there, Edward. Sure. Wait for it. So uh, really once you get past the, um, the turnaround, right off of South Lakeshore Drive there that the CTA buses use, um, you know, there, there's kind of that beach 566, which we'll talk about, but that grassy lawn uh, really holds a ton of Geese. And like I said, there's a wild turkey just wandering around uh, that area this year, which has been pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Um, but but honestly, before I even do get to the parking lot, 
Uh, those trees there can hold a ridiculous number of, of migrants. Uh, you know, it still is kind of the old strategy of what the park district used to do, which is they'd have, you know, big grass lawns and then plant some trees and have some shrubs and stuff like that, which is, it's not, you know, the, the, the greatest of, of, you know, kind of natural habitat, but, uh, you, you can load up on warblers and, and sparrows and, you know, all, all your migrants on a spring or fall day, just as well as you can, uh, up at Montrose. Uh, so that, that's usually... You know, depending on how I'm doing, if I'm walking from 566, uh, you know, I'll kind of work my way there, or maybe sometimes I'll go, you know, actually to the beach and then walk my way back. But, uh, you know, it, the, the Farragut Drive is not necessarily just fly over uh, territory. There, there can be some really good migrant uh, birding in that area there. Yeah, for sure. Isu or Dan, thoughts about where you first go when you get to Rainbow? Um, I think when I get to Rainbow, like most people, um, Carl brings up a really good point of making sure you check all the trees and all the habitat along Farragut. But I think the most exciting part is the dune area um, off the water purification plant where most of the birders like to go. Uh, it's a really great area for sparrows. And if you're lucky at the right time of the year, um, you can get shorebirds on the beach. It's not as great as Montrose, but I know um, some really good shorebirds have showed up here like I know Carl had some marble godwits on the beach one time. Um, and then if you actually go south of the water purification plant, um, you'll notice that there's another little beach here. I don't know whether um, Dan and Carl want to call this beach a part of 566 or a part of Rainbow. We're, um, we're not calling it 566. It is 566. Okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I guess since we're kind of in this area, there was, uh, this is kind of a famous little beach because um, a first state record Wilson's clover from the Gulf of Mexico showed up here. So it's always great um, during spring and fall migration to make sure you're staying the beaches for gulls and, um, uh, and shorebirds and stuff like that. Uh, but anyway, if you get back into the dunes area, um, I think two birds that a lot of people want to see here are Nelson's and Lacan sparrows. Uh, it's probably the best area in Chicago to get these birds. Um, Nelson. And sparrows. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, so anyway, um, this is, yeah, like I said, probably the greatest area to find those birds in the Chicago area. Um, they tend to be pretty habitat selective, so you have to go to a lot of these kind of lakefront dune grass type areas like Montrose or Rainbow um, to find them. But I remember this fall, people were walking through there and counting up to as many as 20 Nelson sparrows. So if you're there, at the right time of year, uh, usually late September, early October, you have a really good chance of finding those, which I think is kind of like a staple specialty bird of Rainbow Beach. Isu, not to interrupt you there, but um, the place to save yourself some walking around, even though they can be found really throughout the, the dune habitat here, the place to go is right here. You'll notice that the vegetation, there's there's kind of a little depression that, that captures some water and the plant type changes uh, a, a little bit here from the other grasses that you see around this area that I'm circling with my house. You know, if, if that's your target bird for heading to Rainbow Beach, just head right to this little area. And that's where the Nel Nelsons and Lacans will be. Um, like I said, they, I, I've had them over, you know, in this area too here. But, you know, if, if you're, if you really want to make sure you get them, this, this is where you go right there. Probably the main thing is to say about Rainbow Beach also is that to look at it, it doesn't look like a great birding location unless you're familiar with the kinds of birds that hang out in those kinds of dunes areas. It, you know, it's not, correct me if I'm wrong, Isu and Carl, but it's not, it's not great warbler area. Uh, it's, you know, it's gotta be this, those grassland types. So you can look at that dune area. And for me, at least the first times I was birding there, I thought, what, what in the world am I gonna find there? But fortunately I was with somebody from COS leading the group. Yeah. And, and I learned pretty quickly that there are many different kinds of terrain to look for birds in. Yeah, there, there are some decent migrant traps. There's trees that line the parking lot here, which, which can load up with warblers. There's one single tree here um, where the mouse is that, that can pull in uh, warblers. And then there's kind of some, like a grassy thicket area, this little triangular piece here that really can, can pull in a lot of uh, uh, migrant sparrows. Um, but I guess, you know, my, my typical procession, you know, as, as he was kind of talking about is, you know, you park in this lot here um, and, and you start walking and, and, you know, kind of walking along the trails here, or usually I'll walk along the beach to, to look for any shorebirds. 
you know, kind of hit this area, work your way along the stone wall here. And then as you come back along this fence, um, there's really good, you know, kind of vegetation here that skulk, skulking birds or sedrens and things like that. Um, like I said, your migrant sparrows. So working this area along the fence is, is really a, a kind of good strategy. You could kind of do a loop here um, uh, yeah, for that area. But uh, um, Edward, I don't know how to relinquish control here. I was looking at the options. So if you just want to take it back. Oh, there, yeah, just I'll just control from here. Yeah. <laughs> So. That was that was Carl navigating the mouse there um, for a moment. I think it's also really important to emphasize here that while we're talking about you know the value of these sites to bird, uh, you know as Dan pointed out, you know at first perception this dune area probably doesn't look like a whole much a whole lot of anything, uh, but there has been tremendous amount of stewardship and restoration work that the park district has sponsored and has been volunteered led that has happened in this area. This whole natural area. Uh, is reflective of a globally rare and endangered habitat type that we have the pleasure of having here in this area. And that's where, you know, all of these rare sparrows and, you know, potentially horned larks and other species are hanging out. It's in these restored dunes here, and it's a huge testament to the last decade of the stewards at that site. The biodiversity beyond the birds certainly also rivals other restoration projects like Montrose Beach or other even intact habitats. Uh, as you're walking through there, also look for, you know, the native cactus that grows there or, uh, you know, the native uh, rare plants like gentians and, you know, specific plants that can only be found in a dune ecosystem. So definitely, you know, take, make the most of that site while you're there uh, and you know, appreciate the, the huge value that even just a small corner of the beach set aside for nature has for all this wildlife, including birds. Edward, no. you, know, you talked about the, the last couple decades of stewardship. Would you mind if I share my screen here? Because I think this is kind Go of ahead, an interesting yeah. aspect of uh, Rainbow Beach is this here is a satellite image from 1938 of Rainbow Beach. Where is it? Well, in the 40s, oh. um, it was actually planned for uh, beginning, I think, in the late 20s. Um, but the Great Depression put a hold on it because these are this is Rainbow Beach right here in the 30s. These two beaches, um, the uh, Great Depression Depression uh, put a hold on this construction project, but um, the uh, the Sawyer Water uh, uh, Restoration Plant opened up in 1947. So when you jump ahead to 19 this one image from 1952, all of a sudden it's now the Rainbow Beach that we kind of see today here. Actually, like, you know, I was just reading on Wikipedia here that when the, this purification plant opened, it was actually the largest purification plant in the world. So it's kind of interesting, you know, sort of like how a lot of the Chicago lakefront is, is artificially constructed. Um, you know, you kind of flip back because, you know, that's where it is before. You can kind of see, you know, we'll talk about steel workers uh, in 566. You can see the work going on here. So you've kind of orient yourself with this little bend right here. And then I said flip back to 52, there's, there's 566, but all of a sudden now there's this little peninsula sticking out there. So, you know, it's, it's not like the restoration work that's going on there is restoring it to a previous state. It's really just creating habitat where one, uh, where habitat never existed. Speaking of habitat that never existed, I understand that Rambo is good for another set of birds as well. Uh, you, want, you guys wanna take on sort of the waterfowl side of Rambo? Yeah. Um, so, you know, when I was kind of talking about my procession, when I usually go to Rainbow, where I kind of walk along the, the beach and then hit the uh, uh, kind of this uh, um, uh, uh, break wall here, that's just really looks like just pieces of concrete that uh, from an old construction, the, the one, the inner one, uh, Edward. Yeah. Yeah. That one right there. Um, that's actually a good place to look for shorebirds that like to perch on there. But there, there's a trail that kind of walks right along uh, the side of that. And usually I will walk to the to the fence line, kind of the corner, right where his mouse is right there. And there, there's a few concrete pieces that are flat enough that you can set on a scope. And the, uh, that is a great place in the wintertime to view the uh, uh, hundreds, sometimes even thousands of diving ducks that will congregate inside this break wall here. Um, at this time of year, uh, you know, having hundreds of greater scop, lesser scop, buffalo head, Redhead, canvasback, ringneck duck, um, you know, we'll, we'll all be there. Scoters, uh, you know, black surf and uh, and white wing will all be there. 
obviously your red breast mergansers. Um, gulls are all over the place there. Horned grebes, you know, all, all your all your kind of diving birds that winter in this area love it inside this crib because the water purification plant, I believe, it's hard to tell. You can't really see very well. And actually, I do know some people who work in the water uh, uh, department, so I should probably just ask them and find out for sure. But I believe it discharges slightly warmed water. So um, in times when uh, the lakes really starts to freeze over for diving ducks that require open water to survive, this is just a great area for them. And I don't know if there's some sort of thing where, you know, because there's warmed water, the fish like, and so diving ducks that feed on those creatures, you know, uh, hang out here. But um, this place will just absolutely get loaded, you know, with, with, with all your winter diving ducks. Um, the other interesting thing too, is that as the lake starts to freeze over, um, that break wall, the outer break wall becomes a pretty good spot to look for snowy owls. Um, uh, so that, that's definitely a good place uh, uh, to check out if you don't mind the frigid weather. You're, you're fairly unprotected when you're uh, standing on that corner of Rainbow Beach. Um, but uh, Very it, you know, close if, to that north wind. Yeah, yeah exactly. It, it can be pretty brutal. Um, but luckily the waves, because of the break wall, uh, don't really build up there and splash you. Um, during warmer times, this has actually been a recurring spot for neotropic cormorant uh, on that outer break wall. Um, so, uh, you know, th those, those are tough, for, I, I struggle to ID those out of the blue, but uh, I think it's now three years maybe in a row that Neotropic Cormorant has visited this, uh, this area. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's definitely a staple. You know, it, once you get past Nelson's and LeConte's season, um, you know, the main reason why you're going to this area is to go look at the area inside the break wall for diving ducks. Yeah, and I think another good thing to point out here is that, um, sort of being sandwiched in between this outer rock jetty and the water purification plant. It's kind of like a windbreaker, which I'm sure is another reason why a lot of birds end up gathering there. The combination of like Carl said, the warm water discharge, which I actually didn't know about, which was really cool. Um, and then again, sort of a blockage from the wind with where the water is more calm. Um, I'm sure that that's also a contributing reason as to why so many birds will winter in that uh, little patch of water. Awesome. Any other thoughts about Rainbow before we move on to our next park? Um, the only thing is uh, the, the gulls tend to hang out uh, more uh, towards the uh, um, uh, towards the west on the beach. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I can't think of any really good gull that is shown up there. But you know, great blackback, lesser blackback, um, glaucus. Uh, you know, the, your your kind of typical winter gulls, that, that's always a good place to look. You know, any, any place where you just get hundreds of gulls, which you do get there is it's kind of a good place to sort through. Um, yeah, trying to think of anything else at uh, Rainbow Beach worth. Any questions uh, from anyone? What's that? Any questions from anyone? Oh yeah. I will say folks, if, if you get annoyed at the dog situation at uh, Montrose, uh, you're gonna have to really uh, yeah, that there is very little dog control at Rainbow Beach. Um, you know, that's it, it's just it's not there like it is at Montrose, where at least there's the effort. Uh, folks bring their loose off-leash dogs all over the place here. So just a uh, just a heads up on that. All right, so now let's go to an area where nobody really goes with their dogs. Hopefully, <laughs> um, moving on down here. So I know that there is some debate. Apparently, Google disagrees with you. Uh, but <laughs> theoretically, our next park, 566, starts right here, again, off of Farragut Drive. Uh, so tell us a little bit about this beach here. Uh, Dan, do you know uh, kind of the story here? Why is this 566 and not Rainbow? And why is there a beach here uh, compared to the rest of the park? Well, technically, who knows? The Chicago Park District might technically call that Rainbow Beach. I, I'm not sure, but Carl and I are uh, just uh, firm believers that that should be considered uh, 566 because- It's south of the plant. It's south of the plant. Plus, uh, just for everyone's information, in uh, 2017, the Park District received a big uh, $600,000 grant to do conservation and restoration work for all of Park 566, and as well as this beach area. 
And so over the last two years, if you've been to these areas, you've seen some pretty dramatic changes. They've put a split rail fence around the area to at least designate it as a, as a true park area. Uh, they've planted jack pines and bur oaks and other sages, and, uh, I mean uh, sedges and things like that. So they're doing some very great work there on that beach and also um, in, the, in the larger uh, Park 566 area. So all that considered, it's the same 600,000 bucks that's being used to restore this beach as well as 566. I say call it all 566. So <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's valid. Let the money talk, right? And well, plus those trees along the south end are loaded with migrants, and our 566 list would take a huge hit if we don't call it 566. <laughs> well, I, I get them to fly in the 566 space at least. There, there you go. Yeah, Dan, Dan waves his arms <laughs> to get him to fly over. So, on that note, I'm going to go ahead and pull up a map here that uh, Dan has created. Can everybody see that? Not yet. Well, let me just reshare the documents. Well, well, Edward's bringing that up. An interesting thing about 566, it's such a desolate looking park. It doesn't attract too many people, at least some just quick uh, tidbits. In the three years from 2015, 16, and 17, the, the park was birded about 30 times a year only. There were only about 30 eBird checklists per year by about 20 birders. In 2018, the park was birded about 270 times, and last year about 470 eBird checklists. So it's it's really getting more popular as people realize what can be found there. And uh, I'm hoping that it'll become the new the Montrose, the Montrose of the South of South Shore. And half of those checklists are you, right, Dan? Uh, well, the first in 2018, it might have been the case. Yeah, <laughs> I, if, if they if you look in the dictionary under patch birder, it just says C Dan. <laughs> I mean, Park Five Six Six has been my patch really, and I've, uh, it's been a great place to to discover what uh, a uh, uh, you know it is a it's a quite desolate looking place, but there are small pockets of, of uh, really great bird activity and, and the prairie. So Edward, if I could just real briefly, the way Carl walked through um, uh, Rainbow Beach, the, the way I normally bird this one is to follow the orange line all along the, the coast, looking for things in the rocks. And then there's always high grasses and other things that the mowing activity doesn't touch. So you can find you can find uh, the furtive birds like uh, the wrens and and uh, of course all kinds of, all the different sparrows. You follow that all the way down to the far end, and then I circle back and follow the dark blue line up along the fence. Uh, I, I normally don't walk that purple line, which is a road that runs right through the middle of the park. Uh, if if you do walk the perimeter of the park have some good boots on because it's rough, difficult to walk terrain. It's a lot of slag and rocks and stuff. If you want just a stroll and an easier walk, take the, take the uh, magenta colored line right down the middle and, and you can uh, have a much more relaxing walk that way. Uh, anyway, that's, that's how I bird it. And, and along the way, there are like around in area number seven, there's a large patch of sumac and poplar and other things where it's, it's great for thrushes, uh, warblers, different sparrows, flycatchers. Uh, eight is a group of sand, big sand piles that has one mulberry bush right in the middle. And it's a great spot for uh, sparrows to seem to congregate there. Uh, it, it's just, the more you walk this park, the more you can realize, boy, this is, this is really a fascinating place. And, it's also, by the way, if you stand around anywhere along the shore along two and three and look back at the city, it's possibly one of the best places in the city to view the city from. It's, it's just a beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful landscape. I seem to recall a certain photo where a turkey showed up, not this year's turkey, but a previous year's turkey showed up and you got a phenomenal photo 
of it walking past the skyline. I'll, I'll see if I can dig up that picture while somebody else talks. I've been talking too much. <laughs> so, I mean, Dan just pointed out, I mean, while it may seem kind of like a strange, weedy, desolate lot, uh, there's a ton of variety in terms of the texture of this site and these sort of habitat types that are held within this site, even without it having gone under any major restoration stewardship work just yet. Carl or Easter, do you guys want to kind of address more the variety, wide variety of birds that can now be found in those different kind of habitat types? What are sort of the spots that you definitely prioritize bushwhacking for some, for birds when you go to this site? Um, so I think with 566, um, as great as it is, a lot of the trees um, are on private property. So if you kind of look on the inside of that blue line, the majority of that all in there, maybe all of it, I think, is private property. So there's a kind of a fence line that runs along that blue line where it's a, it's a really great area to look for your warblers and your sparrows and uh, whatever other passerines you're looking for in there. Whereas it kind of along the shoreline and along the magenta line, it's more prairie stuff. Um, which is also perfect for sparrows, and at this time of year, you'll have snow buntings and laughing longspurs and short-eared owls and stuff like that. Um, so it really offers an exciting diversity of birds. Um, and then on top of that, you have the lake, of course, um, and you have a really great view of the lake. And I think with some of that warm water discharge probably playing a role um, in the waters off 566, there are a lot of ducks to look at. Um, so if you do have a scope, I would definitely recommend bringing your scope to 566 because there are a lot of birds that you're going to want to look at that are kind of further out on the lake. Yeah, one thing, uh, Edward, if you don't mind uh, me jumping in here, just because I, I love the, the, the history of some of these sites here. And I think there's two kind of interesting things. You know, we've been talking about this magenta line. And Edward, if you don't mind, I'm going to uh, steal the screen from you again. Go for it. But that magenta line actually has some roots in history. And um, if you go back, it was actually the main line, uh, the main pathway that, uh, oops, sorry, bounced around here, uh, main pathway uh, along the lakefront for when this was used as a steel plant. Because everything in this area used to be owned by US Steel going way, way back. And so I'll go to a slightly more recent one. I think 1988 is the last time. You can see right here, this pathway became now the walking trail uh, that, that's out there. So you kind of look at, yeah, it looks desolate, you know, kind of now, but if you compare what it was before where you had, you know, huge, uh, you know, steel forges and, and stuff like that, um, you know, it, it's actually quite lush. And, it, you know, if somewhere, I can't remember what year it was exactly, but between 1988 and 1998, uh, US Steel left this site, all the buildings were demolished. Right, and it was. 93? 92. 92. And, and you can see this, this pathway still remains. So that's our magenta line. Um, the other thing that's worth pointing out, and this kind of is, is interesting how it still affects birds out there. And I think you can sort of see it. Let me, let me see if I can see where it pops up here. But in this area uh, was a slag disposal pile. And like I said, there was one where it showed up really well. But uh, Edward, I'll go ahead and relinquish control back and you can go ahead and bring up the, the current uh, uh, image again, because uh, I think you know, when, when I'm burning uh, 566, I, I'm always kind of making sure that I head towards that slag pile. You can kind of see that gray patch right, yep, yeah, right there. Um, so slag is a stony byproduct, for those who don't know, of, of the, the uh, manufacturing process for steel. Um, and so it just got dumped there and this, you kind of go to this area and it's a little bit higher here and it's stony. There's less you know, vegetation because it's not good growing medium. However, it, it kind of mimics uh, a lot of the open country conditions that uh, birds that breed in the Arctic are used to. So your snow buntings, your Lapland longspurs, horn lark and stuff like that, that, that at least in my mind, you know, all, you know, because it's so filled with grasses and other seed bearing plants that just kind of gets blown around, um, it gets captured in this open country area and, and they just, and, and they love it. It's, it's one of my most consistent places to go find, you know, snow bunting, Lapland longspur, uh, horn lark, American pipit. 
Um, and so it's just kind of remarkable how this, this you know, landscape that's been abused by humans and stuff like that, now that the site has seen some care and some restoration, um, you know, going back a hundred years, you know, the, the, the uses of the site are still affecting how the bird life kind of operates around it. Um, the other interesting thing, I think, about the history of the site that kind of affects it, that's if you see that greener patch, and Dan, you might need to help me here because I think you know this history better than I do, but they were dredging, I believe it was Lake Bloomington, is that right? It was Peoria Lake. Lake, Lake Peoria. Um, they were dredging it to deepen the lake, and so they had all this soil from the bottom of the lake, they needed a place to dump it, and there was some sort of program that the state was running that found places to take, you know, uh, good soil that's filled with all those microbes and things like that. And they dumped it right here at 566. Uh, and like I said, I believe they dumped it right in this area. And, and you can see, you know, noticeably, you know, on a satellite image, the vegetation is quite a bit different here um, versus these slaggier areas that are kind of further uh, to the east and south. So like I said, I just think the, the history of a site like this, you know, it, it's a degraded site. Um, uh, but uh, it, you know it's quite uh, quite productive. I mean, dick sissel here. You you can break a couple dozen dick sissel here if if the you know mood is striking them right, no problem. Um, Dan, did you have breeding grasshopper sparrow? Yeah, I was going to say that yeah. my favorite is the grasshopper sparrow. It's almost a given during the yep. summer, and and I've seen I definitely three. There were three nests there last summer, and a couple of summer before. Yeah. Wow. And. And you know the other thing too, when you're if you kind of take Dan's method of, of attacking this, where you, you walk along the co coastline, um, this time of year it is almost guaranteed you will kick up a short-eared owl. Uh, in fact, this year I, I'm I, I was I was like, oh man, I just set the park high on uh, short-eared owls here at, with six or seven, and then the following day someone went out to this uh, to uh, park five six six and had twelve short-eared owls. So um, again, it's right on the lakefront. So it, you know, owl migration is kind of tough to tough to to witness. You know, not like warblers where you can kind of see them during the day. But uh, man, I mean, you 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 come there in you know late October, November. Uh, Short-eared owls, northern harrier uh, can all be really good here. That's fantastic, and I think you know it's a testament. I actually I was lucky enough to come out on a day. When ah uh, oh, there it is there's, there's that the, turkey shot. There's the turkey. I was lucky enough to actually go out on a day when the Chicago Botanic Garden was contracted to do a plant survey of five six six and get a sense uh, kind of an early stage inventory of the biota out there, and uh, definitely can second what Carl was pointing out where there's not a lot of great diversity there. I'd say at least half of what we found was not native. But as you get gradually into that greener area and closer towards Farragut and South Shore Drive, all the diversity does go noticeably up because of that you know, layer of topsoil and the ability for good things to start growing and start coming back. Uh, so it'll be definitely interesting to witness this park continue to evolve over time. It's still a very much changing landscape and as how it's managed and how that will affect the bird diversity that visits the site. Edward, before we move on to another park, uh, yeah. I don't think we, we explained where to, how to get into the park, where to park. Uh, yeah. That's a good point. Very good point. Here, let me pull the map back up again. For someone who hasn't gone there, it can be a bit confusing. There is no parking lot. And so I normally park on Lakeshore Drive, South Lakeshore Drive, just past Farragut. Just, uh, there's parking yeah. right there. There's some good on-street parking there, and then you can just, yeah. There you go. Perfect. Yeah, that's... That's the best place. As long as there's less than three inches of snow, you're okay. You can technically park along Farragut. However, what I would do is, I if you're going to park along Farragut, a uh, Farragut, I would stay at least like a, a hundred yards or so north of the CTA turnaround. There are some signs that tell you. What's it? Did someone say? Oh yeah, there are some signs that 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 kind of identify where you can and cannot park. Um, I, I've parked there, you know, a number of times and never had an issue, but I, I, I would go along with Dan and say park on South Lakeshore Drive there and just walk across. That's usually the best way. For sure. Much safer bet. Well, now that we're already on South Shore Drive, uh, let's scoot on down the lakefront here. So 
This next next park here is Steelworkers Park, uh, which is relevant to our conversation about the steelworks here and what was going on. Um, what makes this park different from 566? Um, I can start. I would, um, Steelworkers is my favorite of these parks. Um, so basically how Steelworkers, how I bird it is um, you have this entrance road here, which is 87th Street. Um, and I take that to the end towards the lake where there's a little parking lot. Um, and then usually what I start out by doing is um, kind of on the north end, there's a channel uh, up there. And right by the channel, there are these two walls. Um, unfortunately, it is private property in between there, but you can kind of work the edges of them at some angles. Uh, and there's a lot of really great shrubbery back there, which is great for passerines. Um, I've had a lot of migrants back there, especially in the, spring and the fall. It's probably the best warbler place at Steelworkers. Um, and I know uh, a friend of mine, Aaron Gillenhall, at one point had access to these private lands. Uh, and I think in between the walls, he once found like a Chuck Wills widow and a Smith's Longspur, uh, which is, those are extremely rare birds in Cook County. So clear. Uh, uh, oh, Isu, I think we lost your sound. Well, uh, issues working through his uh, sound issues there. Um, yeah, you know, the, the between the walls is, is a really fascinating uh, uh, place here. And, you know, it is, you know, just to put it out there, everyone, it is trespassing. <laughs> I would be lying if I say it wasn't one of my regular areas to walk between the walls. Specifically, and again, everyone should follow the law and stuff like that. But if one was going to trespass on private property here, and it's US Steel, so I don't think they care. Um, you, you can kind of walk along, see where Edward's mouse is right now. There, there actually is a footpath um, because the, the land there, it's kind of tough to tell. The land right up against that south wall is depressed a little bit. And it really does, it, it's pretty interesting just because there's a lot of good understory um, that, uh, uh, that you can kind of explore there. So you know, lots of good uh, uh, warblers and stuff. And there are some portals in that wall that you can kind of poke into the area between the walls. And I regularly have Virginia Rail, Sora in there. Um, sometime it will uh, flood a little bit and, and it's overgrown. So it's kind of difficult to walk in there. Um, but uh, it, it's really just an interesting area that honestly, I, I wish I would explore a little bit more. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, those walls for those, again, playing my role of urban historian, those walls are actually the um, old support walls for the cranes that would move gigantic pieces of uh, iron ore across. So, you know, the top of these walls, they just go back and forth, back and forth. Um, now they are great nesting places for Canada geese. Uh, crows like to hang up there. Uh, all sorts of swallows will, will just uh, flock to uh, uh, to those walls and stuff. Nighthawks. Issued, Nighthawks, yeah. Issu, we get you back on sound? Oh, sorry. Did I did I cut out there a little bit? Yeah, we, we, we yeah. lost you there. That's why I started talking. Oh, OK, yeah, because it said my Internet was unstable and I was wondering if you could still hear me or not. No. Uh, anyway, if you can hear me, um, what I was about to start talking about was uh, the breeding birds that Steelworkers has to offer. Um, I was just saying that on the lakefront, um, a lot of it is technically it, well, mostly like cultivated um, parkland. Um, from the parks district, but since these areas are predominantly untouched, um, at least within the last few decades, there's a lot of good breeding birds that use it. Um, and I think. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uh, we lose them again. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll let him keep talking about the breeding birds. Um, so hopefully he comes back here. Um, the other thing with steelworkers that it's, it's a very good place for, again, especially. Oh, I see we get you back. Did I cut out again? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Call your internet service uh, provider and yell at them a little bit. Yeah, Carl, do you want to do you want to talk right now while my internet is not? Sure. Yeah. I, um, but yeah, Steelworkers is a great place for winter gulls. Um, you know, just with that north slip, um, I, I don't know if it was dredged out when the, this was originally constructed, but the water in there will stay uh, uh, unfrozen. Uh, quite a bit longer than uh, uh, a lot of the other kind of near lakefront areas. 
And gulls like to just kind of go up and down there as well as your mergansers, your wintering ducks and things like that. Um, loons are actually pretty uh, common here. Um, I've had both red-throated and common uh, loons here, uh, you know, but, uh, you, and you'll actually get some dabblers too, which you, you know, it's not too common to get dabbling ducks uh, on the lake, but they do like that north slip because it is protected. Um, uh, not to jump from the winter, but I think my high count for black crown night heron uh, in this area is like 25 because on one day on the left, on, on the uh, west side of uh, where there's kind of some old structures there, there were just like 25 black crown night heron all on, on the slip side. Uh, there's where the 41 sign is. Okay. Yeah, uh, they, they were just all congregated there. So that was wacky. But anyways, getting back to winter uh, birding here, um, they've had black leg kitty wake, like I said, all, all your typical, you know, uh, typical other kind of good gulls and glaucus, bonapartes, things like that. But to do that, you usually um, kind of at that very tip, um, Edward, do you know where people set up when they're usually, yep, yeah, right there. Um, that, that, that's where people usually set up their scopes and, and um, that's a great place to look for gulls. Uh, you will usually have to share this area with fishermen. Um, you know, they, they, they really like to visit this area. So uh, good they're out there. Yeah, good perch fishing and, and stuff like that. So, um, but yeah, that, that's, again, it's one of the best places uh, um, to look for gulls. And, and when we do get to this area, it is worth mentioning for those who are particularly uh, uh, into their state list is that we get very close to the Indiana, Illinois border here. Um, you know, th there, there is sort of a way to figure out exactly where that line is, but um, where it, where it probably impacts, I think a lot of people most, most noticeably is that Indiana allows waterfowl hunting uh, in this area. And so actually uh, uh, there was a, a, a birder that was texting me over the weekend because uh, she had not been to 566 in a while and she saw boats out there with decoys uh, firing away at birds. So that is something to be aware of is that uh, um, you will find camouflaged boats uh, at this time of year. I don't, I don't know when hunting season ends, maybe someone can chime in, but whenever, Whenever there is duck season, you you will see plenty of duck hunters uh, kind of hugging the break wall in this area. So just again, another one of those heads up. That's a good thing to know. I did not I was not aware of that. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but also during eruption years, steel workers tends to be a pretty consistent spot for the snowy owl, snowy owl appearances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it is just a great migrant trap spot. I, I, I might have to look this up here. So I'm going to throw a number out. I could be off, but I believe uh, uh, I once had 85 Northern Flicker at Steelworkers. Um, wow. So, you know, is this one of those good lakefront spots? You know, kind of if you think of where this is, as, as you go further towards Indiana, you know, kind of and where birds are coming down or going up, it's, it's a divergent point or a collection point, depending on if they're going north or going south. And so, you know, this little area really starts to, you know, kind of concentrate those birds. So uh, on one of those good days where you get, you know, a lot of birds moving, you can sit there and probably get a few thousand robin, I'd, I'd bet, if, if you were there on the right day and red-winged blackbirds and things like that. All right. Any last thoughts about steelworkers before we move on to our final park here? I think I want to add on just one thing, if you guys can hear me. Yes, go. Um, so sort of in the main uh, park area where it's kind of open and green, kind of looks like a lawn. Um, there are a lot of native plant patches that the city has put in. Um, they're like sort of little fenced off circles of native plants. Um, and then the combination of those native plants plus the open lawn is really great for sparrows. Um, and also I've had other great stuff in the native plant areas as well, but I I was there a couple weeks ago when there were just hundreds of white crowns and white throateds and fox sparrows and juncos everywhere. So um, it's definitely worth picking through all those sparrows, especially in times like um, yeah. October and November. Did we mention the blue grosbeak yet? No, because yeah. I don't have that bird. <laughs> you said, if I'm not mistaken, it's, it's uh, it was, I saw it in, along on the entranceway to the park on that drive. Am I right or not? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that's where it was seen. And because the interesting thing about this, because it hasn't really seen any restoration, it's one of the few areas where you get shrubland habitat. Um, and so you get shrubland birds. And, and actually, this has been uh, 
if you go to the south um, southwest corner of uh, 87th and Lakeshore Drive, so a little bit, there, there's, I think for like five or six years now, Bell's Vireo has bred successfully in this area. But this is one of the you know more typical areas to find northern mockingbird, um, yellow-breasted chat, uh, things like that. So a lot of your shrubland birds uh, uh, like to appear in this area because it's, it's actually decent shrubland habitat. Um, Blue grosbeak, good, perfect example of a shrubland bird that, yeah, love probably loves us. I mean, if we had full access to this whole area, I I I wouldn't be surprised if we found you know blue grosbeak breeding. Yeah, it's probably important to emphasize as we depart from this one that this is another park where major portions of it are still owned by U.S. Steel, um, and really the only public portion is directly along the lakefront. This whole big square down here is largely abandoned space, but it is privately owned, so it's fenced off. But to Carl's point, because it's been let go, nobody's managing it in any capacity, there's a lot of fantastic kind of weedy shrubbery that's grown up in here that makes for fantastic bird habitat. It is slated to eventually be turned into a housing development, um, which, you know, I mean, is, is great for other reasons, but uh, uh, I would love to, you know, if, if anyone has $36 million, which is what I believe uh, the private property here last went for when it was sold, um, I would gladly take it off your hands and buy all this land here and preserve it for nature. But uh, we'll rename Blue Ghost Speaks after you. There you go. When the, once I get that 37 large, I'll, uh, I'll take care of it. <laughs> and on that note, uh, another area where we could definitely use money to purchase extra land around it but still a phenomenal birding park and the last park on our itinerary here, just south, continuing along South Shore Drive, which ultimately turns into Ewing Avenue. This might be a little bit of a you know, complicated park to get to, again, according to Google, but the easiest way to know how to get here is if you continue South Shore Drive as it turns into Ewing Avenue, crosses the Calumet River, you're gonna get to 95th Street, you know, home of the famous 95th Street Bridge where the Blues Brother jump happened. Just turn off of 90 onto 95th Street heading east, and that street will take you directly into our next spot, Calumet Park. Now, Calumet Park is an interesting one because unlike these other sites we've talked about so far, it's not really managed for habitat. So can somebody kind of start us off with what are you going to be looking for at this park? Uh, I, I can start it off, I guess. Um, so I think Calumet Park uh, is a really good place um, at all times of year, but uh, I think it's predominantly birded in the middle of the winter. Um, again, most of the water is in Indiana, but if you look south of this Coast Guard station in the middle of the park, there's a little cove uh, down there where a lot of the ducks like to gather. Um, I know people have had really good birds in there, like you can get long-tailed ducks, you can get all three of the scoters if you're lucky, um, red-necked grebes. It's also really great for gulls, like great black-backed and lesser black-backed, especially when a lot of the ice freezes over and you'll end up getting lots of gulls sitting in this sort of cove area down here. Um, but I think another exciting thing about Calumet Park at this time of year is that there are hundreds, maybe even over a thousand geese that winter in this park. And if you pick through them, you might get lucky. Um, usually there's a couple of cackling geese that like to hang out in there as well as occasionally snow geese and white fronted geese, which tend to be some pretty difficult birds in the Chicago area. So if you're cruising through here, make sure you're taking a look uh, through these ball fields and kind of in the water off the park because you might have uh, one of the rare geese species uh, sitting in there with the big Canada flock. Incidentally, I'd also point out that uh, these are some massive parks and Calumet Park is certainly no exception. So if you're looking for a great place to be able to do your birding and hang out and walk around and have plenty of space to social distance, this is a phenomenal park to do it. Lots of parking spots all around the park, parking lots, paved trails along the roads, hitting all of these sites. Really great park to go to to just spread out and get some room and stretch your legs. I'm not sure. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry, just real quick. I'm not sure if they've been seen in the last couple of years or not, but the area like around uh, 12 o'clock on the if, if the park if the road around the park is a circle somewhere in that 12 o'clock area there's a bunch there's pine trees up in that area that have been good for long-eared owls in the winter ah interesting yeah I, I've every time I go there in winter I'm always checking that for saw wets 
owls in general. Um, that that's a great yeah. That 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 line of pines there is um, yeah is is one of the kind of must check every time you're there. Um, Edward, mind if I take over uh, the mouse uh, again yeah, real quick? You got a so, oh, you got a slady back goal there too, right? Yeah. So I <laughs> yeah I I slady back goal. It was, it was presumably one of the slady backs that was hanging around um, Dead Stick Pond uh, in the Calumet area. But a couple things to note here, um, like Isu said, he was right on that this is probably birded most heavily in the uh, in the winter. Although, again, just by virtue of its location, um, so there's like a little uh, uh, beach house here. Um, th you know, there's plenty of good understory and trees here that get loaded with warblers. You know, it, it's it's just good location, even if it's not particularly great habitat. It's just good location. So every now and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop by in the spring, especially when you get spring ducks moving and you can get you know pretty good numbers at this park um, of, of migrant passerines. But um, if you are gonna bird this, I'm gonna zoom in as far as I can here. Um, you can kind of see here this overhang. Well, there's this building kind of has two parts. There's you know kind of a part here and a part here with an open area that gives you kind of a nice view of the lake. This is a great area to go because you will have a roof over your head and you'll be protected on either side. So you can set up your scope here. And now, now with the really high lake levels, uh, the water comes right up here. But if, if, you know, if you're out there February howling winds and stuff like that, and you want to do a lake watch, but you know, don't want to be exposed, this is a great area to do it. You just park in the lot here um, and, and you can, can look out with your scope at this area. Similarly, if, if you want even more comfortable gulling, if you go around to, this part of the park here, you can park, you know, along uh, 98th Street here and just kind of look out in this protected area. You don't really see it here, but there are um, uh, like wood posts driven in here that gulls like to hang around. But this parking lot here, you can actually just park facing the lake and just sit there from your car and just do a lake watch. And and if gulls start to come in, you can throw out with some, you know, uh, throw out some white bread or something like that to get them in here. But you know when it's negative 10 degrees and you still want to get that uh, lake watch uh, itch going, just park right here and look out. And like I said, you, you can get all, all other good gulls, ducks, and stuff like that. Um, you know you can get really good flocks of juncos and American tree sparrows just kind of working up and down this, uh, uh, working up and down that drive there. Um, yeah, trying to think uh, any other tidbits, but yeah, those are the two big areas. Like if you're going in winters. Scan, scan the fields for geese and, uh, and then, you know, look for gulls. I think so. sort of while Carl's talking about lake watching, a sort of interesting uh, geographical part of all of these south side parks is that um, the lakefront gradually becomes further and further east um, in Chicago as you go south. So once you get towards the south side, the lakefront is actually kind of, it's curving east. Um, and if you, yeah, if Edward zooms on it all the way, that's a really good way to see it. But a lot of the gulls, so if you were to, not gulls, but any sort of seabird in general, if you kind of draw a straight line from somewhere out towards the middle of the lake, like up, up north, you know, maybe eight to 10 miles out, if those birds fly straight down the lake, they end up at places like 566 in Calumet Park, which is um, partly why I believe that there's so many ducks uh, and stuff like that to see here. Um, this is sort of unrelated, but if you go to the bottom of the lake at places like Miller Beach in Indiana, you have, have you know record numbers of species that we in Chicago rarely ever get to see. So if you ever want to go lake watching, um, I definitely recommend going to places like 566 where birds are hitting the bottom of the lake and starting to kind of investigate the shoreline. Um, so yeah, I think geographically, um, all these parks are very interesting given their eastern location kind of sticking out into the middle of the lake like that yeah and there's um you know th that's a great point because you know again when you when you start talking about lake watching and, and and you know water birds and stuff you know on land we look at plants we can tell oh there's a tree there's understory there's type of grass you can understand like what birds you might get but um uh you know with water we can't really see under the water well, all along the lakefront, especially the South Lakefront, starting at like 47th Street, where there's the Morgan Shoal. Um, I think there's a shoal um, uh, uh, just beyond the break wall at Rainbow Beach. Um, all these areas are really fertile lake areas. I think Google might even show it. Zoom into Rainbow Beach. Let's see if Google 
Google has the underwater features there. Keep zooming into that outer. Yeah, they do. Yeah, the Clark Point Shoal. Um, you know, those are things that you know we can't really see. And and maybe maybe if we were more coastal, I think we would understand better how sub water conditions and and you know what what's under the water affects what birds we get uh, above it. But you know, I don't know that it's given a whole lot of study in in the Great Lakes. But a lot of these areas here, you know, the reason why birds congregate here is because along these shoals, it's you know, like, you know, limestone formations that just have the right uh, uh, pH or water temperature or something like that for, for fish or other creatures that they feed on. So if you're a diving duck, you want to be close to this food source. And so I, I think it's something that I would love to see uh, some more study about that because I really think, you know, it, it would make a lot more sense as to where all these ducks and gulls and stuff like that are spending their time if we knew what was under the water. It's interesting you should bring that up too, because I know some relatively research coming from some folks that worked at Shedd Aquarium and uh, Illinois Department of Research is we're looking at these shoals, you know, Morgan Point, which is up by 47th, what you were talking about in this one here, where they tend to be congregations for food sources like fish and crayfish and uh, mussel species uh, and can also be nurseries for these species, unlike other portions of the lake, or at least certainly uh, concentrate those species a lot more. All right, so we're starting to reach uh, Carl Jr.'s uh, bedtime here, but uh, to our speakers, do we have any kind of final thoughts related to these South Shore parks here? Uh, while I also check the chat here and to our audience, if you have questions, please go ahead and put those in the chat. All I was gonna say is that, man, if, if the South Lakefront got birded like Montrose and Lincoln Park did, I, I, I would, except for maybe shorebirds, I, I think the South Lakefront would blow away Montrose. That's my, that's, my, that's my South Side pride. <laughs> so please, please, you know, please look up uh, when CO, you know, if, if you're unsure of these areas and need uh, some guidance, please look up when, uh, you know, COS is having walks. We're happy to take you down there, but it, it really is such an underexplored area. I mean, what Dan has uncovered at 566 has been just astounding. I mean, the, the bird list that, that, that he's found there where, I said it, it's jealousy inducing uh, uh, from what Dan has found at 566. And there's no reason why Steelworkers, Rainbow, and all those other places can't be just as good. Yeah, it okay. looks like someone asked, yeah, how safe are these sites for a lone woman? Uh, Dan, I mean, 566. I've done it a number of times, okay. and it's, there's so few people there that you know nobody you know if somebody's intent on something nasty it's not a place for they're going to go because there's nothing there quite often, and i don't feel the least bit worried i mean any place in the urban area you've got to be alert but i've never felt uneasy or threatened and i go there quite often all, yeah. all those places I, i've been there uh, more than 200 times per year over the last couple of years and never had any trouble whatsoever except uh, sometimes there are folks walking big dogs, and that's yes. scared me a couple times when they didn't have their dog under control. Other than that, I, I'm much more scared of those dogs than I am of the coyotes that are there. So, <laughs> For sure. But, but I never felt uh, uh, uneasy in any way uh, at, at five, six years. Yeah. I was scared when you go there the first time, but I finally decided there wouldn't be any muggers lurking there because they'd have to wait a long time and they'd go someplace else. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a pretty miserable place uh, uh, to, 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 I was like, okay, I'm going to hide out here and maybe in a week someone will come by. <laughs> hide in the short grass. <laughs> but in all seriousness, no, that, that is honestly kind of why I like going to these places. You know, I mean, Montrose is magical. And like I said, I tease Montrose because it is so magical. But you know, for, for, for someone who kind of wants to get away from it and feel like you're a little bit, you know, kind of, uh, out in nature and, and stuff like that to, to go a place and, you know, 566 frequented by coyotes a lot, you know, to go out there and look around and see no one is it, actually kind of, it's kind of a nice experience, you know, living in a big city like Chicago. Yeah, for sure. Any other questions? If you got a question at this point, there's, I think if you want to just get to unmute and ask it yourself, go right ahead. So what, if you're going further south in Indiana, what are some good places to go just over the border there? Uh, 
Let's see. Well, unfortunately, no, Indiana no. did not do quite as good of a job at protecting their lakefront as uh, Chicago did. So the, 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 the first good habitat that I'm aware of um, that's, that's really kind of worth going is I, honestly, I think like uh, the Marquette, Miller Beach basically. Um, uh, so you kind of have to go quite a ways. However, if you do go straight south from uh, uh, Cal Park, um, you do get to Wolf Lake and Eggers Grove, which is, you know, top notch. Mm. Um, but yeah, so because uh, uh, unfortunately, I think was it BP Whiting or something? I, I can't remember exactly what companies are there, but um, the 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 Indiana what, right when you cross the border there, it's 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 pretty bad, um, unfortunately. Yeah, all, that's yeah. Um, that's BP in Whiting. They have a refinery. I'm pretty sure that's like what a huge portion of this area down here is. Oh, yeah, there you go. What happened with uh, Donna, Jeff Williamson walked down there and he dragged us into the BP to look at a beach for gulls. Of, of course he did, because that's, that's, <laughs> that's what Jeff does. Yeah. <laughs> but, that was yeah. like the time I went to CBC at the Illinois Beach State Park and there's a coal plant there. So we went right into the coal plant because the warm water out there was perfect for ducks. But yeah, there's a couple of uh, public beaches as well. There's a harbor here just into like Whining and Hammond. Uh, there are some good traps as well that trap birds very similar to how some of these uh, Southeast Chicago parks do. Any other questions? This was super helpful to hear from you guys how you bird these places. I've been down there just maybe five times, I guess, uh, maybe, maybe eight combining all those areas, um, but didn't have a good sense of where to go by myself. So very helpful. One word of note about uh, like 566 and steelworkers, because they are kind of exposed, the wind can can greatly affect the enjoyability and success mm. of burning. Um, if it's really windy, and Dan, you've been there obviously, you know, more than I have, but birds can be very uncooperative if, if it's really windy. Um, <laughs> You know, you'll you'll see you'll see a lot of sparrows flying away from you. Um, uh, so you know, don't don't be surprised if you go there at, at a particular time and instead of getting 25, 35, 40 birds, you get 12. Um, you know, it it, it 12 species. Uh, it, it it can happen. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it, the 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 wind conditions are are very very uh, uh, influential on the. Uh, uh, success of your birding endeavor, at, especially at 566. Good, good point. Yeah. I'll, I'll add one more thing is the further south you go on Lakeshore Drive, the less and less traffic there is. So I find it much right. more pleasant. To, I, I live in the south suburbs, so I've come up from the south and it's mm -hmm. a pleasant drive, unlike driving to Montrose. It's not a pleasant drive for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I can't imagine. Well, and the, the great thing too about you know the South Lakefront, and, and really like when you start combining the South Lakefront and the Calumet area, is that there, there are seven or eight like A plus birding sites you can hit with driving five ten minutes in between all of them. So you know you can you can create whatever kind of day you want based on what birds you're seeing. If it's going to be a dabbling duck day, you you hit some of the Calumet areas and maybe go to Rainbow Beach and look inside the break wall. If it's going to be a sparrow day. You know, you go to Steelworkers and 566. So the, you know, there's really a, a lot of things you can do, a lot of different habitats you can hit. And it, that, that's why I just like it so, so much. It's just, you know, it, everything is right there. Yeah, between Lake Calumet down here, kind of at the south end, the far south end of the city and all the parks associated with that, Wolf Lake right on the border, all of the parks we discussed here today. It's a very nice, tight area. And just to further entice people, I'm going to give a prediction as to the next bird that's going to be added to Park 566 uh, list here. Careful, and we're recording this. It's it's going to be Yellow Rail. Yellow Rail will be added to Park 566 in the next year or two, is my prediction. Okay. So go we'll go down there and start looking for it. <laughs> All right, Dan, you you heard you heard it there. Get on it. I wouldn't know one if it hit me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on that note, I think this is as good a place to stop as any. 
Uh, thank you, first and foremost, a virtual round of applause for our expert birders here, Carl, Isu, Dan. Thank you so much for taking some time this evening to share with us your knowledge of these sites and where you go and how you do it and the best ways to approach these parks. Uh, hopefully everybody here found this useful. Now, if you're heading out there by yourself, you actually kind of know what to do, what's up, where to go. You know, just start walking in circles and get lost in, you know, the abandoned steel lot between the walls. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. This is really great conversation. Uh, if you wanna access this again or share this with a friend, we have recorded it. We'll be getting it up on our YouTube page relatively soon here, as soon as I get on top of it. Uh, but once again, thank you guys all so much and have a great week. Great, I guess the weekend's over, but have a great week. Enjoy, have some great winter birding here. It's been a phenomenal November, so get out there. Look for some birds. And hopefully we'll see you at a distance um, out on the birding trail. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thanks, see you.